Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, what is unfortunately the final one of our Penn Awards webinar series. Um, it's been a it's been a great journey, and we will we, we certainly heard some very interesting presentations. And I know that today we are going to hear from two great presenters with some very interesting things to tell us. So today. Obviously, I'm going to just spend the next couple of minutes just giving you a welcome and in introduction, and certainly welcome to our two presenters, Nikki and Sally, and welcome to all the people who are listening, and also to the people who will be listening when we um, when we put it up on the website. Um, I'm going to just spend a couple of minutes just quickly running through the winning principles um, and the framework, but I'm certainly not going to, to bore you with much detail. Then we're going to hear from Sally um, Eason from NHS Arden uh, on Coming Home, a mental health repatriation program. Finally, we're going to hear from Nikki Thomas from NHS Devon and North Cornwall uh, on commissioning for patient experience. And I think it's great that we're going to hear from, from two good commissioners today. At the end of the session, we'll have plenty of opportunity for questions. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, the reasoning behind these webinars is um, from the Penn Awards. I mean, this is our, it is our stated aim that we identify, share, and disseminate great practice in patient experience. Um, and each year we try and do something different, and we try and reach out more and more to people um, to find more ways of getting this great work out. So hence, we have had support from NHS England and from PICA, and we or NHS Improving Quality, I beg your pardon, and PICA, and we very much thank them for um, enabling us to put these webinars out. They also supported the Winning Principles Report, um, and what we found with the Winning Principles, um, these are the kind of themes that run through great um, pra best practice in patient experience, and they tended to fall into uh, four areas. First was intention and outlook, and what we found with, with all our initiatives was that there was a passion and determination behind them. Um, it's not so much about uh, investing huge amounts of money, but it is definitely we need the passion and determination to make it all happen. We also found that um, broadening perspectives was a key. Um, supporting and educating professionals to look beyond their own situations. And by that we mean what I find with, with the NHS is quite often we only think in terms of specialities or particular settings. And very much with these programs and, and successful um, patient experience initiatives, they are very much transferable right across the board into areas that uh, you perhaps wouldn't think of initially. The final one is keeping it simple. And in fact, keeping it simple is, is really the underlying theme for today's two presentations. It's about making initiatives easy for people to understand. So keep it simple. One of those principles that I learned a very long time ago, um, and certainly avoiding overcomplications, avoiding too much jargon and language, um, certainly helps people to understand uh, and implement better. The second of the areas was organizational support. Creating a culture where everyone's engaged is absolutely vital to making it successful. And, it, and remember, I mean, there may be individuals who lead um, and, or who make the initial stand but it's teamwork, very much teamwork. Management is, a, is an area that we've come across as being a blocker in many cases, and often um, certainly middle management, but senior level support is quite often key to the success of a project. Leadership. Now, this is not necessarily taking it from senior management, but clinical leadership, leadership from a, from a, a team leader, or even leadership from an individual. Um, just to get things going and kick-started, and then to drive things forward. So organizational support is very important. Evidence and impact. Now, these are, these are areas that we really like people to think about. You know, financial impact. We know from experience that creating great patient experience pays dividends, and actually, in many, in many ways, will actually improve the performance of an organization. Building professional relationships, working in partnership, and interestingly, we, we, we introduced a partnership working category last year to our awards, uh, and it was a huge success because it's clear that you know, 
quite difficult sometimes to, to achieve things on your own. Working with other groups really uh, helps to make things happen. And showing, as, as we're going to show today, um, sustainability and transferability. And if you can develop an initiative that can be used across the whole range of um, the healthcare industry, uh, certainly helps with success. Okay, uh, I'm going to leave questions to the end. So if, if you have any questions during the, uh, during the presentations, it would be great if we could sort of leave them to a question se session at the end of, of the, um, the two presentations. So, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sally Eason from NHS Arden Commissioning Support, and I know she's going to tell us all about coming home. So, over to you, Sally. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, as I say, my name's Sally Eason. I work in the transformation team for Arden and GEM Commission Support Units, and uh, for those know you, who know your geography, Arden is uh, uh, Shakespeare's country, so Coventry, Warwickshire, Worcestershire, and Gem is Greater East Midlands, which feels like a, a line from Leicestershire to the to the uh, to the uh, to the sea in the, on, on the east. So it's quite a wide footprint that we've got. Um, so I'd, so our commission support unit provides a range of commission support for um, our customers. We've got a good uh, BI function, financial management, communications, and contract management to ensure rough, uh, robust infrastructure for the organisations we work with. Um, we also provide some clinical services, uh, continuing health care, uh, personal health budgets. I'm going to particularly focus on um, some work that we've done through our transformation and redesign team, where we support our customers with uh, change programs, both strategic change, but also pathway redesign. So, so that's us. Um, I want to focus on a, on a real cross-cutting cross piece of work, which we've been undertaking um, across mental health services over the last few years. And actually, um, Louise, your introduction and the key areas that you flagged up uh, certainly rang true in terms of, um, of how they have been the sort of bedrock of the pieces of work that we've done really over the last, of the piece of work we've done over the last few years. So if I just, uh, I'll run through a little bit about the background, um, um, about how we worked in partnership to develop the sort of the scheme and, and, and move it forward, and actually sort of really share some examples of of bringing to life the patient experience as a consequence of the work that we've done, really, and uh, and then bring you a little bit up to date with with uh, how that program is developing going forward. Um, I think just in terms of sort of uh, background and context, um, it was about 2011 when we first started doing some of this work, and really um, on a recognition that. Uh, that there was an over-reliance in our wider system across Coventry and Warwickshire on our, um, our patients with quite, men with quite complex mental health issues were getting their care and support out of area. Um, we recognised that uh, there were over 400 patients were identified. A lot of them were a long way from family and friends, and, um, and they didn't really connect back into our local area. So, we, we sort of lost touch with them really in terms of having robust clinical reviews of placements um, and uh, and some of the some of the placements that people were in were not being regularly sort of checked and understood if the patients themselves were still getting the the right level of support um, so, and I think there was a recognition that we had got to a point where um, well, people were not proactively being followed up and we needed to to really revisit that for a whole number of reasons. One, obviously we, we recognised that it was a very poor patient experience, uh, make no bones about the fact that there were some real financial drivers there. When we, when we, when we reflected and, and investigated, we understood that we're actually spending more money on mental health services outside of our locality than we were within, and that was quite a, an eye-opener really, so there was a real need to do something different. So our start of the 10 really, um, was uh, that's how we started to work around uh, mental health repatriation or coming home as, as, as we, we, we called it. And our, our real starting point was actually recognising if we put patients at the heart of all of this, then we needed to design a system that was better. Um, all the sort of participants of this had actually sort of uh, lost, lost sight a little bit of where patients were, at whose responsibility and actively following up. And um, so what we started to do was actually understand across all organisations, and that was um, uh, primary care trusts at the time who were just transitioning into clinical commissioning groups. It was with our local authorities, 
it was it was with um, our principal provider, Coventry and Warwickshire Partnership Trust, and we really it was a, very much a case of sitting down and uh, putting patients at the heart and saying, actually, what's the shared purpose of this piece of work? What do we want to achieve? And that essentially was about bringing people back uh, to their local area, um, reconnecting them with family and friends and wrapping clinical support and wider support in their, in their home locality, which we felt would really speed and aid their recovery and give them sort of a support network locally. Um, so it's, almost, it's actually quite easy to, uh, when I look back, to actually just say that and say, well, we just got around the table and started doing that. And if I just think about all the things Louise said earlier, um, there was a huge amount of work um, in how we started to do that. And it did start around the table saying, how are we going to do it? What does that involve? Um, and there are a number of key, we, key things that came to fore in that sense. We recognised that actually we had to, we had to sort of almost re review and redesign the whole system uh, because every time we started doing that, going down one route, uh, we recognised that there were multiple people involved in, in that part of the system. But our real starter was actually sort of develop, sort of recruiting an experienced clinical review team from mental health nursing, occupational therapy, um, and we also included social care staff in there to develop a sort of confirm and challenge. Um, there was a lot of reviewing of patients who were on our out of area list. I'm sure you'll all be very familiar with that. And um, and and we started to use that as an opportunity just to sort of unpick when people have been reviewed, what their experience was and really started to do very practical things like getting our, our key reviewers, to our key staff to go out and start undertaking a really sort of independent review of individuals, um, where they reach in recovery goals, where how how far away from they've been bring, brought back into local area. So, so it started off with very much a sort of a reviewing process. Um, that flagged up a whole host of issues about was our local um, area uh, did it have enough robust infrastructure to be able to provide that additional support to people? So there was a spin-off about sort of developing more bespoke packages, redesigning some of our local services so that they were able to really support people coming back. We developed some very um, uh, facilitative arrangements in-house, really, it, it, which was actually... Um, for every recommended change to a package, we had a really clear confirm and challenge with clinicians, with social care staff, with others, just to test out if that was the right approach for people. Um, but it was always about identifying and articulating what was in the best needs of that individual patient. So some of those uh, reviews from initial contact with patients and family to actually bringing them back into the local area uh, took from, you know, could take anything from six months to 14, 15 months because it was really important that people uh, were supported to move and their goals identified at the time that was right for them. Um, so for some people, we recognised that where they were living was the right place for them and we made suitable arrangements to ensure they were supported. For others, it was about changing their package of care and then monitoring them to support them back. And for quite a lot, it was saying... Um, we want to support your recovery in local services. So we did actually sort of develop a lot more local packages of care. Um, interestingly, there were things that we were, um, we had anticipated but were bigger challenges than we thought. Some of the um, independent and third sector organisations that were um, caring for and supporting um, local people in, in uh, localities outside of Coventry and Warwickshire were... Um, initially quite defensive about our approaches and, and uh, not keen that, that people moved for a whole host of reasons. So we've had to work quite hard with them and recognise the sort of the benefit for, uh, for patients. We had some local challenges with clinicians feeling quite anxious that really, really complex people were coming back. Were they equipped to deal with it? So we had to support them in looking at alternative ways of, of wrapping around appropriate packages of support. But... Um, and we had some challenges from, from, from colleagues across the piece, really, about was this the right approach. One of the things that we always did when the going got tough was there was no blame involved in this. It was always back to what's best for the patient, how best do we meet their needs, how do we ensure that they are supported to onto a recovery pathway with um, good clinical support, good social care support, and, and closer to their, to their family and friends. So there was quite a long programme of work inherent in all of that really. 
Um, so that's the sort of the that's the sort of process, really, in a sense that sort of that that that, that we un we underwent. We developed a framework for repatriation, uh, very much in partnership with individuals and their families, um, and we were involved in all of the partners. The, C the CCGs, as they tr sort of came to be, in, were very much a key part of that. Um, we had social care staff, very much a key part of that. Really good clinicians, part of all of that, and families were very much. Um, partners in ensuring that sort of the people moved in a timely and appropriate fashion. Um, we also had a, a sort of an attempt to really sort of ensure that our local infrastructure was developing and redesigning itself throughout. I think one of the key things that, that, that we wrapped around it was we used a sequence to incentivize our, um, our local trust to be actively involved. I have to say they didn't really need an incentive, but the sequin users was an opportunity to ring fence resource to recruit the team and start to change and deliver um, and shape the infrastructure that was required to make the changes. And it was really important to us that there was no um, perverse incentives. So if somebody went out of area and then they were brought back, that wasn't a sort of a they didn't get bonus points for bringing somebody back. It was actually about um, making sure that we were undertaking uh, um, changes in, in patients' experience for the right reasons. So that was the sort of the, 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 the um, infrastructure and architecture and process that we used. Um, something of a whistle-stop tour around that, but um, happy to take questions afterwards. And it's always really funny when you sort of try to, to uh, summarise several years' work in a, a couple of minutes. It makes it sound incredibly easy. Um, as I'm sure you can understand, there were a, a number of uh, quite challenging experiences and incidents throughout all of that. But actually, we've, we've come through and, and, and done what I think is a, a really positive piece of work. But what's, what's more important is actually, um, you know, our mantra throughout was about keeping patients at the heart. So um, there's a couple of sort of key stories that I would just like to highlight. We did a, we did, and we did do um, a couple of brief videos about this, which brings up, brings to life the patient stories, and um, you know, we can we can share share some of some share links to that for for, for clinicians um, offline if if people are interested. But just just um, just bring into bring into life Michael's story. Um, Michael um, had, uh, had a long history of mental health issues from quite a young age, difficult family circumstances, um, uh, sort of a ch checkered adolescence, been in and out of acute uh, mental health wards, and had ended up in a um, rehabilitation unit in Wolverhampton. Um, it was quite difficult for his family to visit, whilst it's only about 35 miles away. Um, there are a number of reasons that made that quite problematic, um, and um, and Michael wasn't really thriving in that placement. Um, uh, he was being supported, but he wasn't thriving. The clinical review team um, did a lot of work with Michael. It took about uh, 12 months from first contact, first discussion with him and family, to really sort of um, sort of to prepare him to come back and to prepare the support that was around him. Um, he was subsequently moved back into the local area with his own flat, with support workers going round, with a real sort of like a, a, um, a program of real goals that he was aiming to, to, to achieve and really improved his living skills. And he's actively involved in, in his family in supporting his skills development. Um, he's progressed enormously and, and featured in one of our sort of uh, our videos about sort of telling the story. And, and, and actually, one of the poignant things that, uh, that Michael was identified is that one of the nicest things is about having that regular contact with his family. He feels a part of, a part of that wider family contact now and, uh, and just made the observation that I can have a cup of tea around my nans and that's the best bit about it. And it's those human stories that start to, to bring those together, really. So that was Michael's story. Um, Pam's is quite different. Um, uh, Pam's husband suffers from dementia. And, um, and was placed uh, his quite, uh, quite, quite challenging behaviour and was placed um, about a 45 minute drive away from, from, from where Pam and Keith had lived. Uh, Pam actually approached the team, uh, clinical review team, to see if there's an opportunity to bring him closer to home because she was 
find it quite difficult to just to to drive that distance um, on a regular basis to uh, uh, um, to, to, to to see see keys. And she wa she wanted to be able to pop in regularly several times a day um, rather than once or twice a week. So the team worked with her and with Keith to identify a, a placement that was appropriate for him. And um, and it's been really important for, for them now as uh, as Keith's uh, um, condition has deteriorated for to be actually, he's 10 miles down the road, Pam's been able to have regular uh, contact with him and, um, and gets to see him on a much more regular basis and uh, it's far less stressful for, for both really given, given Keith's condition. So again, it's about maintaining those family ties, um, being able to um, to maintain that sort of their their relationship, and just to sort of be part of Pam and Keith to be part of each other's life on a sort of a daily basis, rather than a sort of a, um, a sort of a journey once or twice a week. So again, it's very much about sort of delivering sort of patient focused approach to it. Um, so Craig, Craig's story again is interesting. I mean, the, as Craig said, he's over the moon to be back in his local area. He'd previously lived in Nottingham, and um, you know, just and uh, is really being supported intensely to develop his uh, basic living skills and to run his own flat. He's been doing some work experience at um, at a local um, uh, um, animal 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 um, rescue centre and really starting to develop that skills and confidence. That's something that he would never have been able to do several years ago. Again, as a vulnerable uh, young man who'd been in and out of mental health services and uh, had often been taken advantage of by his peers. So the support, there was a very bespoke package of support wrapped around him. We recognised what was needed to, to enable him to come back into local services. Um, so, and, and he's really developed his skills and confidence and, uh, and the amount of support that he is required has 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 uh, reduced over time, and he's continued to sort of to do his volunteering, and those sort of like stories are very much a snapshot of of the of the um, of the work that the uh, the clinical review team and the whole program has been focused on, and uh, and and it's those sorts of stories that have essentially been the centre and the motivation for sort of like for the for for the work that we've been doing. So there's been a number of positive outcomes. All the patient stories are positive outcomes, but uh, you know, but on a, on a very global scale, we've had over 100 people have been repatriated, stroke returned to local areas, and uh, and many more have had their care packages adjusted to ensure that their current needs are being met. Uh, and some of those individuals who've had their care packages um, adjusted are on a sort of a, a timeline of when 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 do we think you're going to be able to come back into local area? Because that's actually what we want. It's, uh, it's to help their recovery. Um, finance was obviously a driver at the beginning and has been made, has, has, has maintained, has continued to be so. Um, actually saved over £12 million pounds of cost savings across all of the three clinical commissioning group areas. That's across Coventry and Warwickshire. Um, with new out of area costs avoided by ensuring best use, best, best use of local providers and redesign of the infrastructure of our, our local um, mental health trust. Learning, many of the patients have really benefited from being closer to friends and family with the support to help them become part of their community. And family have welcomed that engagement and, uh, you know, and being much closer to the sort of like um, to support, which is really helpful. Um, and, and we've expanded um, the project o over time. Our initial focus was very much around mental health issues. Um, but we've included older people with dementia where some of our local facilities were not um, uh, able to meet some of the challenges. We've been able to, to, to change that. And more recently, we've been working with people with learning disabilities um, and linking much more closely with local authority colleagues about what opportunities are there to bring people, um, people back there. So uh, what next? Um, really positive news now is that um, we continue to as assess patients, um, as I said, including those with learned disabilities and dementia. Um, the clinical review team has now been um, is now a substantive part of our local infrastructure. We've used the sequin to fund the service over a number of years, and it's also working closely with some of our local independent and third sector providers um, just to, to ensure that 
those people who have been placed locally are still continuing to get the level of support that reflects their needs and are there different ways of delivering that. So we've really started to redesign the, the whole infrastructure. Um, and, and, and the sort of um, the raison d'etre essentially is to ensure that patients continue to receive the most um, appropriate care in the right environment. I think it's really important to, to flag that our clinical review team is not replacing the role of local um, community mental health teams and others. Um, the review team take on a very specialist uh, review function and work really closely with local services to ensure um, that actually the sort of the, the local teams are supporting people as appropriate and maintaining and supporting them to uh, on their recovery pathway. Um, so I think there's a number of key things that in terms of summary. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, a lot of the headlines over the last few years have been about people with mental health services really being forced out of area, being placed many, many miles away from their home environment and the impact that, ha that has on them. I think we've bucked the local trend. We have actually brought people back locally. We've developed our infrastructure. We've got a positive relationship with a lot of local providers who are responsive to some of the more complex needs that we are dealing with. And, and, our, and our clinicians are really embracing um, a thinking differently about how we can, how we can support people. Um, obviously, we've saved our clinical commissioning groups um, more than £12 million over a three-year period. And I, I think it's really important to say that a lot of that resource has been invested into local services to develop that infrastructure. Um, and that's been really, really important in terms of sort of consolidating our local services. Um, and actually, um, in terms of supporting people back into local areas, it's, it's improved the patient experience, it's improved the family experience, and, um, and actually people um, making people feel really valued. I think our sort of final sort of summary around this is that we were really thrilled to be um, winner of the um, Health Service Journal, Journal Value and Improvement in Mental Health, Health Awards this year. So that was uh, icing on the cake after sort of several years of really hard work in developing the infrastructure and progressing the work that's gone on in this particular programme. So I'm bound to have talked for more than 10 minutes, but hey ho. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, that was in, um, in, inspiring and, and brilliant. I have listened to it and just got more and more excited about the work that you're doing, and I was pretty excited about it before. I mean, it's a very topical area given the initiatives that were um, launched yesterday. And it, for me, it's a perfect example of how improved patient experience can reduce costs and just improve performance and satisfaction right across the board. It, it is really excellent. And I love the very human approach to, to a difficult area of healthcare. Um, and one thing I really picked up on was the, the no blame. You know, that it, it's a fundamental issue, isn't it? You know, ha making sure that yeah. you look after what's best for the patient and it's a case of what's gone, has gone. Yeah. You know, we need to look forward. So it's phenomenal. I think that's um, it's a really important point, actually. One of the things that, that uh, throughout, it was, it was about having that shared pur purpose, what the patient experience is, and actually taking a very positive problem solving approach um, about every issue and and that's and that's actually helped us to flush out where some of the challenges in the system were and it wasn't a saying it was anybody's fault it was just they'd evolved and that's what it is but that but it was so it was an opportunity in a very positive way to say okay that's what it is what do we need to do to make it work for us to deliver an improvement yep. and um, and and that was hard work <laughs> when you when you when you summarize something very quickly you forget some of the challenges that you've had but actually that focus about you know what's the end result of all of this was such a driving force that it did unite people across a lot of uh, challenges and barriers that had previously been there and and that's actually what's kept us through throughout well it's great work Sally and I and I trust it will continue and grow over the next few years I think a lot of people can learn things from that. So thank you very much, Sally. Pleasure. Um, questions, we'll take questions at the end, if we may, because I would now like to introduce you to Nikki Thomas from NHS England, Devon and Cornwall area team, who's going to talk to us about commissioning patient experience. So Nikki, take it away. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. It's like afternoon now, isn't it? Um, yeah, so I want to talk to you about a submission that we made last year to Penn, and that was uh, a project that we've been undertaking now for the last two years around developing patient participation groups in Devon, Cornwall, and the Isles of Scilly. Um, 
So, without any further ado, so the context and background about this, so just for you that don't know, this isn't Shakespeare's country. I'm not sure whose it is, but, it, but it's long and thin, and it's got a population of about 1.7 million across Devon, Cornwall, and the Isle of Scilly, um, and a very challenging rural and urban area to, to look after, with a total at the time of around 233 GP practices, and that's slightly now reduced. Um, how this project came about was when NHS England formed, I was looking around what we might want to do around developing patient experience and how the patient voice in terms of primary care was highlighted. I think there's lots and lots of great work about um, acute trusts and how patient voice and patient participation and patient involvement happens, but I'm not sure at, at the time, and I'm still not overly convinced about how we're listening to the patient voice um, from within primary care, in particular around those around GP practices and how patients can get involved in, in service improvement. So I looked at the, the DES, the Direct Enhanced Service, which was out uh, available for people um, practices to claim against for PPG development. And at the time that was looking at um, uh, the cost of about one pound ten pence per head of population, so a considerable amount of money for some GP practices to claim in terms of having a PPG. And I'd sat on the the appeal process for those that didn't um, get the money awarded to them, and started to look at the the mass variation in terms of patient participation in primary care. And I, where I thought that was good, and where probably, if I'm honest, on more occasions than not, that wasn't so good, and that actually maybe this was more about money than it actually was about developing patient voices in, in primary care. So I wrote a bid to NHS England Compassion in Practice Fund that they had at the time uh, and looked at four stages of, of doing a, a piece of work. So the, today I'm going to talk about stage one and that's patient participation group um, development. And for phase one, I commissioned the Patients Association to deliver this. And currently we're, we're completing phase two around Centre for Patient Leadership. But the reason that I commissioned an external agency um, to provide this um, project, uh, to run the project, was around providing an independent voice. I thought we'd get much more positive reaction if um, uh, an independent sector agency was working with GP practices rather than NHS England given its direct commissioning responsibility in terms of primary care. So, so after the lengthy process around tender and, and appointing and single tender agreements, etc., which shouldn't be underestimated by any stretch of the imagination, um, we moved on to working with the Patient Association to deliver our aims and objectives, which you can see on screen. And that was around developing PPGs um, and having one program, one voice, um, but very much co-production and co-design at the heart. Um, and also to improve the level of participation and involvement opportunities for people in primary care. So the patient association with the patients that they'd identified through PPG set up a steering group and there was no NHS um, representation on the steering group and there still doesn't. I'm only allowed to go invite only, which is great. Um, but the steering group uh, were tasked with co-producing, amongst other things, uh, specification for PPGs. They were asked to co-produce and design a toolkit, um, which they don't actually like the term toolkit. They call it a information and support pack because they thought toolkit actually wasn't or highlighted the fact that actually maybe something was wrong and actually it wasn't. And what they wanted to be was informative and supportive. So in, in the Patient Association website, you'll see it termed as an information and support pack. But it includes really useful things like terms of reference that they've written, recruitment strategies, recruitment tools, job descriptions, appraisal frameworks for chairs, training tools, posters, um, it, lots of very different things that um, actually they've designed that make sense to them and actually they're really great and they've been uh, quality checked across all the PPGs that we've been working with. Um, we were talking to PPGs about contractual obligations of GP practices so they knew what they should uh, be doing and, and also the, the potentially the money associated with that in terms of contractual obligations. They found that really informative. We've provided them some training and support so we've run um, some webinars particularly around things like social media and, and communication skills. And we've also built in some evaluation and some action learning which we'll get onto a little bit further. Um, so what's the, the project been about? So the project's been running for about two years. 
as I said, we had a patient-led steering group. They've met probably every six weeks in a variety of settings around, around Devon and Cornwall, usually in one of the GP practices or in one of the community hospitals where obviously we could get access or they could get access to free rooms. They've, they decided early on that what they wanted to do was hold a, a selection of workshops in the community a variety of different times of day um, for practices, um, practice managers, GPs, practice nurses, but they also invited the independent sector, health watch and local charities, health and social care forums, and also they did invite CCG staff and lay members. Uh, and they were really successful in terms of bringing in people that weren't normally listened to but also in educating people like uh, GPs in particular and practice managers about what a PPG could do rather than what it was currently doing. And some good examples of that are around, around the challenge of um, what is a PPG versus friends of a local GP practice. And actually there's a, there's a mild difference. Um, and actually GPs started to under, starting to understand how patients could help them deliver improved services and actually start to look at some of the services that they currently provided that they may not need to. So what, one of the successes I've already mentioned is about the fact that this information and support pack is now available um, and the comms we've had around that. So patients have hosted um, via Patient Voice South um, webinars on social media and the buddy scheme that they have in place. And the buddy scheme was particularly successful for where we had GP practices coming forward saying, actually, I haven't got a PPG at all. Um, contractually, going forward, I need one. And how might the best uh, support be provided to me to make sure that I've got one that functions for the right reasons rather than just ticking the box? So they were really good um, practices that were coming forward. And actually, we then matched them up with fellow practices, hopefully either nearby or, or relatively within the same sort of geographical area. Um, to, to take them forward and support them and attend each other's meetings just to, in terms of to get the right feel for the meeting. We've produced um, a, a plethora of films um, that was developed by the Patients Association and by the patients themselves. And the films are either of themselves or of PPGs working or GPs talking about the importance of PPGs. And there's also some films um, about some work that was spun off around how we might involve children and young people in um, PPG development, which I'll talk about more about in a minute. Um, and one of the things that we, we found early on was that, that lots of other people were really interested in the patient voice in the primary care. Um, so an early discussion that was had with Plymouth University was around how we might involve student nurses to become interested in talking to PPGs as part of their three-year training. Uh, and this was on the back of um, also strengthening patient experience within the nurse training um, program, but also thinking about how student nurses and other students, if I'm that honest, needed to develop their skills about how to talk to people when they're patients when they're well rather than versus when they're unwell. And there's been some really good examples of how that's helped the student nurses and the, the nurses of the future. Um, so Plymouth University came on board with a pilot uh, program which is just finished. Um, around 25 student nurses being affiliated to a PPG in their local area and helping them to really understand the health agenda and, and in particular health promotion and health prevention around how PPGs can help that. A similar discussion has taken place and is, work is continuing with Exmouth College and that's around how PPGs within that area are working with Exmouth College to get the voice of the young person. Um, we've had some tentative discussions and works commencing now with Peninsula Medical School and that's the same as Plymouth University except for talking to junior doctors and hopefully future GPs about PPGs and patient involvement. Primary and secondary schools have produced some films as well which are really interesting to watch on the Patients Association website, produced some films about what health means to them and some pictures and I've, I've got a couple for you a bit later on about actually what what their voice looks like and, and, and as we would all suspect it's completely different to what to what the majority of the PPG members are, are are made up of in terms of demographics and they just generally for our geographical area tend to be the older white and um, usually female patient. Um, 
And also they've been doing some work with vulnerable groups around how we get the voice of the vulnerable group in some PPGs and that's been worked with the homeless and also with the deaf and blind schools in the local area and about how, how that voice is heard and taken forward in terms of primary care development. So we've facilitated at least, at least 20 new PPGs across the patch, um, which is fantastic in terms of we didn't have to drag these PPGs to the table, actually these practices to the table, actually through some of the, the workshops that were being held and through some of perhaps competition with local practices, we'd started to see other practices coming together and saying, actually, we'd quite like to do that too. Um, Friends and Family Test was obviously um, a driver as well in terms of the PPGs have now started in some areas to look at actually how they work with the FFT information and also how they drive it forward in, in terms of getting a response. So in July this year we held a conference with Plymouth University, um, which you can see the, the student nurses that were part of the pilot are in the middle picture. Uh, the PPG conference was hosted by Plymouth University and we had over 130 participants and that was a mixture of student nurses, PPG uh, members, GPs and other people from the local community and we held some great um, conversations in the morning with NX England, CQC, um, the local GP lead, medical school, the LMC came and they held some great discussions about what we might think about doing next and then in the afternoon there was a series of workshops for, for members to um, or participants to, to take part in. Um, and you can see one of the pictures here from, from one of the children that was involved in the project earlier on about how receptionists be, must be friendly when poorly people arrive. It was really interesting as well. One of the other pictures was about how all the notices are uh, about health and how they manage health are all above our heads and we can't read them. So but there were some great, some great sort of um, involvement there from children and, and one of the winners um, poster you can see on the right hand side was from um, a local Plymouth area. Um, one of the celebrations of that day was it was right at the end of the day we held an award ceremony for the PPGs about and they had to submit in a certain category um, and the awards they, they didn't know this was necessarily happening in terms of the presentation of the awards and the local press and, and that was just a great local celebration of of what they'd done not forgetting at any moment in time all these people are volunteers. So these are the awards, the five, set, the five criteria we have for our awards around um, maintaining PPG development going forward. But identifying the main concerns of patients, changing changes made as a consequence of your PPG, raising awareness about health, communicating the work and involving schools. And that's the one at the bottom where you see the two ladies that had won about involving local schools and colleges. So 14 recommendations were made um, in our final report on phase one and they can be viewed on, on um, the Patients Association website and there's a link there for you to click on. We're just in discussions at the moment with the Patients Association about how we, we make that wider available and, and they just moved on to Wharton Forest as another area to, to roll this project into, into that area and take the lessons learned. But some of the recommendations and some of the learning is obviously going to, going to roll forward into future areas. And, and I suppose one of the things that they've changed moving forward into Wharton Forest is around actually the patient-led steering group was a fantastic idea, but it did need some NHS or GP um, representation on that gr group. And they, they felt that actually on reflection, the patients felt on the steering group that they could have achieved probably some more if they'd have had some active and champion GPs in the room. Um, so, I'll, so I'll leave it there and um, thank you for listening and look forward to any questions you may have or indeed if you've got any questions about the other phases of our project um, that I haven't talked about today because obviously 10, 15 minutes is <laughs> unusual for me to talk in. But I think I've done it, Louise. Oh, I think you've done a great job, Sally. <laughs> Yeah, brilliant. Um, sorry, Nikki. <laughs> I'm looking at the wrong information here. I do do apologise, Nikki. I think you've done a great job there. Um, certainly giving us a really good insight into um, what is, certainly from your, my view is if you can make it work in your geographical area, you can make it work anywhere because you've got some real hurdles to overcome. Um, and certainly, you know, primary care initiative involving the GP practices 
um, that it's great to see some good work being done in that area. Um, I, I really like the buddy scheme. I thought that was a great idea. You know, why reinvent the wheel? You know, there's lots already out there, so learn from it and, and just have that idea that you're not alone. Um, and <laughs> funnily enough, your picture reminded me of something we did yesterday. We were talking about um, you know, the, the first port of call and, and walking into a hospital when you're feeling particularly nervous or vulnerable um, and meeting Vinegar Face. Um, yeah. that, that was something we talked about yesterday. Um, had, and the other, the other thing that came out really powerfully for me was, was the, the awards that you're doing. Um, you know, celebration. It's something obviously that, that you're aware of that we're very keen on at Penn. You know, they're amazingly, it's amazingly powerful to, to actually recognize um, the great work that people are doing. You know, it makes people feel great about the work they're doing. It brings the ideas forward. It gets them shared. So, yeah, and, and I certainly it's a great motivator, isn't it? And that was really hard to judge because obviously the project was across over 230 practices. We had hundreds of patients involved at all times. And it was really difficult because at the beginning we kind of thought that we wouldn't get any submissions and that asking, that asking patient groups to submit a poster or submit something in terms of to be judged was quite hard. And at the beginning we didn't have anything, but then we were overwhelmed with the number of um, posters that came in. That In the end we had to book an additional room at the university just to host them all. Um, and, and that was fantastic in terms of, you know, really worrying that, we, that we'd that we ask too much. You know, it was hard to think about where you draw the line between asking people, patients as volunteers, to do some work, where you draw the line. But, yeah, we were overwhelmed in, in the response. But just absolutely wanted to celebrate that they'd done a fantastic job. It's, it's great. And I, I, it, it's, in, it's inspirational work, so it's fantastic. Um, Obviously, we've heard two great presentations, and thank you very much indeed, Nikki, for, for your presentation. Um, I know the questions come through. Um, so if, if I'll kick off, and then if anybody wants to come in and actually ask a question um, themselves, that would be great. great. Um, first of all, a question for Sally that's come through. We talked about the, the no-blame principle. Um, how easy was it to stick to the no-blame principle? Um, it was uh, challenging to say the least, but it, it was it was we actually set out at the very start and had and drew up um, rules of engagement across all organisations, um, and it and it it was really quite basic around that. But when when the going got tough, as I'm sure anybody that's been involved in any sort of partnership working will understand, there are times when. Um, we all retrench back into our organisations and it starts to be, uh, you know, it's easier to say it's somebody else's fault than it is to say actually we are where we are. So we kept going back to our rules of engagement to, to say that the only way we were going to achieve what we wanted to achieve was by um, tackling the problems collectively. And I think the other thing which was really important throughout that is um, we did constantly sort of maintain a very positive um, approach to all of those challenges. So if people were coming up with, oh, it's a problem to do this with a problem to do that, we actually tried to turn that round so that the people that were raising the issues were very much part of the solution. And, and that will sometimes sound, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, all sort of, you know, motherhood and apple pie. And I don't want it to sound like that because we did have some very, very tense meetings at various points. So, um, and there was also, uh, can, I'm sure you can imagine quite a lot of behind the scenes telephone conversations and behind the, uh, and a lot of one-to-one -one trying to understand people's um, uh, concerns and anxieties around that, which weren't things that people were necessarily going to express in, um, in an open meeting. So there was a lot of uh, behind the scenes work. And, um, and, and actually that, that was about building the trust and that was about building the trust across all, uh, across all organisations, um, and uh, and it, and it was a constant part of the work that we did. It was apps, it was something we kept coming back to throughout. Um, I'm just I mean one of the concerns. I mean I'll be very honest. One of the issues that we had sometimes was some of our local clinical staff feeling quite anxious that people that they had previously been providing clinical for support for and had gone out of area had been incredibly complex. 
and um, and were quite anxious about what that would mean um, when they came back into the local area. So there was a lot of work that we needed to do with them um, around that actually what that, that the support that they would get, the additional infrastructure that was around, the fact that actually we were trying to look at things differently for people. It wasn't about um, being critical of what might have been their clinical practice. The decisions were made for the right reasons at the time, but this was about um, uh, recognising that the best interest of the patient will be in that local. It's how that we managed to support them that. So um, it was, uh, I suppose it's difficult to sum up, you know, how you do that, but it was a lot of, um, it, just, it was actually quite a lot of hard work, but, but a fundamental belief across all organisations that we were doing the right thing. And there was a lot of behind the scenes, um, a swaging of anxieties and building up trust, because uh, I'm sure people recognise that um, health systems are not always um, uh, um, sort of uh, blessed with um, trusting relationships across the board, yeah. and we had to make it make it obvious to people is that no one organisation would um, benefit to the detriment of another. So that was really important about being open about that. Is that yeah. any any savings were about savings for the health economy, yeah. health and social Excellent. care economy? I should have said then. <laughs> and I mean that Excellent. in wider sense, really. <laughs> Yes. I've still got a few scars. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all bear those, don't we, when we've been That's into <laughs> Um Okay, a, a question for Nikki. Um, in terms of actually sort of taking on the project of, of putting these groups together, what do you think was the biggest challenge that you had and, and how did you deal with it? Um, I think probably the biggest challenge was from the GPs themselves, and I and I don't say that lightly, and I don't I don't mean that in a really negative way. I think it was really challenging early on in in assessing the DES payments and not giving them the money. That was relatively easy. So in terms of what happened preempting the project was around actually me looking at what they were doing around patient participation groups, seeing what they'd submitted in terms of finance they wanted associated with that and turning it down and then trying to get them to come on board to make that better with a real challenge about uh, the reasons that we were doing that and that was the important bit about the independent sector being involved because actually there was a stage where mm. I was a part of the appeal process for PPG monies um, and then I was also then inviting them to take part in the project and it could be seen in kind of a, the wrong way but actually it was really key that, that, that another agency was involved in terms of taking forward the project and working with them on a day-to-day -day basis and that was a that was a a learner and a quick win because actually it's, it was really hard for the GPs themselves and the practices to turn away the patient's association when they turned up saying I really want to talk to you about patient involvement. So they, they were the hardest kind of challenge but actually once you got them on board they were the biggest success in, in a very challenging yeah, time that we live in for GPs at the moment we all were aware of, of how up against the wall they are um, and then to ask them to do something else um, which we all know in the world of patient experience takes a lot of energy as well. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's interesting that, that that it was highlighted that the, the GPs and I and it, I was I was fascinated to see that that might be that might be the sort of the key area and and to learn how you overcame uh, overcame it was great. And I, I mean, and they actually talked to you about that separately. Yeah, and there were loads. Of ch I mean, obviously there were challenges from the patients themselves and what they wanted to do and how how they thought that we had an agenda in telling them what to do for the project and it was hard for the patients that were already involved to, to get their head around the principles of co-design and co-production and they found it really bizarre that I sort of went to their first steering group and said like kind of over to you, see you in 18 months time uh, with, with mm. relatively limited expectations from them. It was really hard for the patients to get that. Not as hard as, as NHS employees found that in terms of can we have an update on your project? No because actually it's being coded on by patients. It was really hard to, for, for some, probably some of my fellow colleagues to understand the principles of if you are, really are someone to code on and co-produce something, you just leave them to it. Yeah. Because we're, we're always after a red, amber, green, aren't we? Where are we on we the are. piece of work? Are we red, are we amber, are we green? What's the action plan actually? 
there were no rules kind of there were some principles around it but actually there weren't any rules about reporting and, and that was hard for NHS colleagues to appreciate but actually they did manage in, in, the, in the long run right. well it's funny how time flies isn't it everybody because it's now almost one o'clock oh, we done. <laughs> and we have heard two great presentations and I really want to say thanks ever so much to Nikki and to Sally um, you know, I, I for one, have found it absolutely inspiring to listen to the pair of you because you've tackled areas that are really not, not easy to tackle at all um, and quite big projects as well. And the results have been phenomenal. So thank you for sharing that with us, Nikki and Sally. Um, just, remains, just remains to say we are very much hoping that we will be running another set of webinars in the new year that we're looking at at the moment, um, to say thank you to NHS IQ and to PICA for making it all happen. And thank you to everybody who's been listening and everybody who's presented. So thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Sally. Um, go and enjoy the rest of today. <laughs>